Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, mercy, God, and for your grace. We thank you, God, that even in times of technical difficulties, that you're still God and sovereign. And so we turn, we have already turned, but we know this uh, worst time of worship is for you and to honor you. So any plans or any ideas or structure that was put in place, we know that you got our, our, our sovereign over all of that. So we thank you for this time. We pray that you be with us as we look at your word today. Teach us what you would have us to know about us and teach us what you would have us to know about yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm excited. John. We're in John. And as I said before, uh, we're going to look at evangelism, basically looking at telling people about Christ. One of the things that God told us to do before he left was to go out into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And I think it's time for us as a local body of Christ to get on board and to begin to, in our community, I know we're already doing it, but to turn up the heat a bit, if you would, to actually being a light in the world of darkness, sharing Christ with people, let them know what the gospel is. And it coincides because a while ago I was thinking about doing John, so I think it coincides uh, beautifully. So, Book of John, we gave you a little history already. Turn to me to John chapter 20. So I don't know how many of you do this if you, uh, am I recording? Um, okay. I don't know how many of you do this if you're reading a book, you go to the end of the book just to see what's going to happen. Anybody do that? Y'all? So you do that? That sounds like something you do. <laughs> Jump to the end. You do that too, B? <laughs> so uh, sometimes we go to the end to see. So what we're going to do, we're going to start at the end of the book of John, book of John chapter 20. And what John does, John was one of God's, Christ's disciples. He basically tells you in chapter 20 why, why he wrote this book. He says, listen, he, he wrote the book, he wrote the letter, wrote the book, and then at the end he said, by the way, this is why I wrote it. So let's look at that, John chapter 20. Verse 30, John 20, 30 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John said, listen, Christ did a whole bunch of stuff. I can't even, it's not enough books to write them. He said this in the, in the next um, uh, the next, the next um, chapter, verse 21, 25 says this, and there are so many other things that Jesus did, which if every one of them were written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Now, that gets me excited because I'm like, what was he doing? <laughs> I mean, we got four gospels of stuff that he was doing, like four books. You mean to tell me that he did so much other stuff that the world couldn't hold the volumes of books in three years, like, what was he doing? I know there's some crazy stories going on. It was exciting. When I get to heaven, I'll, I'll ask him. But John says, back in chapter 20, these are written. Out of all the things he did, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John basically says, this is the gospel. The reason I wrote this is for the gospel. What we are supposed to preach, what we are going to go into the community and tell is the gospel. And John sums it up right here in John chapter 20, verse 31. First thing he says, if you look at some of the elements there, and these are the elements when we're talking about what is the gospel. How do we tell people about the gospel of Christ? Christ, it has to have these elements things. One of the things that he says is, these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so John says, listen, what I want, the reason I wrote this is so you can understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Son of God, if you remember, we, and Padilla says this often, the Bible is an Eastern Oriental book. Okay, so it's written, written for people of Eastern culture. So they have phrases in the Eastern cultures and ideas in the Eastern culture that are different than ideas in our culture. We live in a Western culture. And so we have different phrases. So when we look at the Bible, we have to not read it like we're reading a Western book. We have to read the Bible like we're reading an Eastern book and understand phrases. And so the phrase son of God to us, Western son. I'm the daddy. Jaden's my son. So it's a son. I'm older. Jaden's younger. I'm different. Jaden's different. I'm in charge. Jaden's not in charge. That's our mentality. Okay. 
In the Eastern culture, this phrase, son of God, doesn't even have anything to do with son. This phrase, son of God, means of the same stuff. Of the same, the proper word is essence. What son of God means that when they say Jesus is the son of God, that means Jesus is of the same stuff, of the same essence that God is. And so what John is saying, the reason I wrote this book is so you can understand that Jesus is God. That's why he wrote it. So the gospel, to understand that, I need to understand first that there is God. And what do we know about God? John's going to get into that in John chapter 1. We know that God, according to scriptures, is creator. God is over his creation. He's in charge of his creation. And Jesus Christ, this person, is actually God. So that's the first thing that John says. The reason I wrote this book is so you can understand, hey, that God exists. Now, remember, he's writing to the Jews. They knew that. They didn't have no issues with that. Their issue with the fact was that this guy walking around actually called himself God. The second thing John said in this, these are written so that you may believe not only that Jesus is God, but that he, Jesus is the Messiah. So the second thing he says, I'm writing this book, the gospel message, because remember, so that you may believe and that you may have life in his name. So that's what the whole sum of this is for. He said, I need you to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, what does that mean to the Jews, Hebrews, that he was writing to? Well, understanding that Jesus is the Messiah sets off a few things. One, that he is the promised one. All in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, all the way back to Genesis, when the fall came and Adam ate the fruit and he disobeyed God and he decided to go his way instead of God's way. And then God showed up and he said, what, what's going on? What's, what, what happened? This woman you gave me, blah, 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 blah. So Jesus, God then began to hand out the curses. The result of your disobedient Adam is as follows. And he told him what would happen. In that Genesis chapter three, he says, oh, by the way, the seed of a woman will come. And he, talking to Satan at that time, you will Nip his heel, eh, cause a little issue, but he will crush your head. When your head is crushed, that's it. If I remember the, the mountain and the guy from Dorn, your head is crushed, it's a wrap. And so what John said, I want you to understand that he's God. God is this God's creator. He is the creator God. I also want you to understand that he is the promised one who's coming to end the tyranny of sin. In the tyranny, I'm going to try to spell that. Oh, thank you. In the tyranny of the devil. That's who this person is. And so there's sin because there was the fall. And so when man disobeyed God and because of that, this Messiah is coming to end that to bring an end to that. And so what does that tell us? That tell us that in the gospel message, not only do I need to understand that God exists, that he's creator, and that he's here, but I also need to understand that there is a problem. The problem is there was a fall, and Satan came and convinced us, and we chose to go our way. I'm going to put here my way. Versus God's way. Because of that fall, sin into the world. And the Bible said death came with sin. And so what, Paul, what John is saying is saying, I wrote this to you so you understand that that death and that sin that came when we chose our way against God's way, the Messiah, the promised one, God promised that he would send someone to rectify death, to rectify sin, and that's who I'm writing this book to tell you about. Not only that, he would be, he would take the punishment for our rebellion. Bible says in Isaiah, what does it mean by Messiah? Isaiah tells us a couple things. Isaiah tells us, that's the I in there. Isaiah 
Isaiah tells us that he will be bruised for our iniquities. He says that the pierce for our transgression and bruised for our iniquity. And so this Messiah is going to take the punishment for us choosing our own way. What does that introduce? When they hear Messiah, they know Isaiah said the Messiah is going to come, going to take the punishment for our sins. Again, the gospel message lets us know that we have a problem. We chose our own way. That was sin. And there's a punishment for that. That punishment is death. But the Messiah has come to take the punishment and the penalty for that. That's what John said. Also, that he would die. Isaiah chapter 52, 9 says that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to die. In Psalm 61, David wrote that this Messiah who's coming to die, he's going to raise again from the dead. And so in this, just by saying, I wrote this so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The Jews, when they saw that, all this stuff was wrapped up in that. It wasn't just, okay, he's the Messiah. Cool. No. To believe that he's Messiah means to also understand and believe that there is sin and there's a punishment of sin, death, because we have rebelled against God and chose my way over God's way. And when that happened in the beginning with Adam, God said that now sin has entered the world. So Satan now is a God of this earth. But God promised that though sin and Satan would nip his heel, that God would crush Satan and crush sin and crush death by taking our punishment and dying on the cross. And so the Old Testament tells us, and the Messiah said that he is going to die and he is going to rise again. These are elements of the gospel message. This is why John wrote this, to let you understand that. And finally, when you hear, not finally, yeah, when you talk about it, 2 Samuel chapter 7 talks about that there will be a kingly throne starting with David and it will end with the Messiah. And so the Jews understood in this word Messiah meant that there was a kingdom and that God was coming to bring his kingdom. So he was the king bringing his kingdom. So no matter what was going on, remember we had the time we went through Daniel. In Daniel, we talked about the kingdom of men, and they were bears, and they were lions, and they were beasts, and they were goats with horns and eyes, and they were destruction, and they were coming out this, uh, 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 this ocean of wrath, and they were just causing pain. But there was going to be a kingdom in the end that would be everlasting. It was the kingdom of God. And in that, he would wipe out all of the kingdoms, wipe out this tyranny of the devil, and all of a sudden, there will be a kingdom of peace on the earth, reigned by God. And so no matter what you are going through, church, folks, Jews, understand that in the end, there is hope because what you see, the pain you go through now, the suffering you go through now, the stuff you're not understanding right now, that is not the end because the Messiah that John is about to tell you about says that the, he is going to be the king, bringing his kingdom, and his kingdom is the kingdom of peace, and it is a message of hope to us of eternal life. And so John said, listen, I'm writing this to you, these elements of the gospel, so you may know that he is God. God exists. He is creator God. He is Messiah. And all that has to do with Messiah. Why do we need Messiah? Because we've sinned. What is sin? Rebellion is against God. What's rebellion? I'm going my way instead of God's way. Oh, is there any penalty for that? Or is God just like, cool, do what you want to do? No, God is just. He can't do that. So he has to punish us for that. What's the punishment? Death, both physically and spiritually. Bible says that when sin entered the world, death came by sin. And so people get old and then they die. Trees grow and then they die. Animals get old and then they die. The earth is cool and then all of a sudden you get thorns and thistles and things die. Because of sin. And so Christ came to take the punishment of our sins by him dying. And then the victory over death by raising again, bringing his kingdom as king of peace and hope. That's the gospel message. This is a message that the world needs to know. Paul, John then said, but these are written so that you may. Here's a beautiful word. This word is all through the book of John. And we're going to be seeing this a lot. 
These are written. There's so many things I could write about, John said. But I specifically chose these and wrote these so that you may believe these two things. But what does believe mean? When we look at the scriptures, remember, the Bible is an Eastern Orient book. So for us, believe means, oh, yeah, that's cool. I believe that LeBron James is the best player on the planet. I believe it. Well, I believe KD is the best player on the planet. Okay, you can believe that. I can believe this. We cool. That's not what believe means in the scripture. To us, belief is just like, ah, I figure that's probably cool. But when we look in the Bible, when you look all through John, that word believe has an idea that I am willing to die for this. And let me tell you, I really believe LeBron is the best player in the world. But if somebody put a gun to my head <laughs> and says, Olu, are you willing to, <laughs> it again? Are you willing to die for the fact that LeBron is in the definite world? Are you willing to sacrifice your life and the life of your three children and your wife for the fact that LeBron is the best player in the world? And I will quickly say, nah, bruh, <laughs> it ain't that serious. <laughs> it's not that serious. But when the scripture says believe, that means I am willing to give my life. I am willing to die for this fact. John said, these are written so that you may believe. That has something more than just, eh, Katie, LeBron. No, that's a passionate acceptance and an internalizing of that idea, of that concept. That's what it means to believe. See, it's not the fact that I know, okay, Jesus, God, cool. Because you can see it in John. The Bible even said, Paul's even said, the, uh, the demons know that. So knowing something is different from believe. When the scripture says believe, that means I have eternalized this. I have put this as the number one thing in my life. I am ready to die for this idea. And so belief, when, Paul, when John, I keep saying Paul, when John talks about it, belief means that I am going to, and I'm going to write these down so you can see it, turn to him, I am willing to abandon my rebellion. What's rebellion again? Going my way. God says, you go this way. Adam says, eh. God said, don't eat the fruit, but I'm going to eat the fruit. I could go God's way, but I'm going to go my way. And that's what sin is. Sin is when I go against what God tells me to do. That's why it's referred to as scriptures as rebellion. So to believe means not only am I going to turn, I'm going away from God. I'm going away from Jesus. I'm going to turn to him. Not only am I going to turn to them, I'm going to abandon my rebellion. I'm going to give it up. There's some things with me. God's still working on me. You know, I've been saved for 72 years, but God's still working on me. I still cuss up. You're out if I have to. No, that's, that's not belief. See, it's more than just I like God now and I'm turning to him. That means I'm going to abandon. What does abandon mean? Get rid of. Abandon even has the idea I'm getting rid of and not even thinking about it. An abandonment? I got rid of it and it's not even in my mind no more. I've turned. I've walked away. To believe means to abandon my rebellion. I'm not, this, my way stuff, I'm done with that. God's still working on me? No, I'm done with it. Ain't no working on me. I've been saved for 47 years. I'm done with it. I ain't cussing nobody out no more. That's not what I do. Why? Because I've abandoned that rebellion against God. Uh, uh, it means to, <laughs> I like this. I read this somewhere. Drop your, and I, use, I entered this word here, your futile weapons of rebellion. The Bible says that we are enemies of God because we decided to go our way. We're enemies of God. And as an enemy, that means we went down and we picked up some weapons. Oh, yeah, God. <laughs> yeah, let's fight. I think how stupid that is. <laughs> because we're talking about the creator, Yahweh, Jehovah, El Shaddai, the uncaused cause. We, in our stupid ignorance, decided to rebel against that. We took to God and said, okay, God, put them up. Let's fight. And we grabbed our weapons. And this is what sin is. This is why sin is so terrible. It's more than just, oh, you know, I, I do what I do. You know, I've, I've got there yet. I'm still trying my best to get better. No, 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 no. 
We are in an active rebellion against God. We have picked up weapons to fight against God. Let's go, God. To believe means to turn to him, abandon my rebellion, and drop my futile. I say futile because it's a joke. Drop your futile weapons of rebellion against God. And then place, place our trust and reliance. I love that word. On him. That's what it means to believe God. So when we look at the gospel message, it's more than just, repeat after me. It's more than just, how many want to come and change your life? It's more than just, you need a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, all those things are correct. But what we have done in modern society, we've taken certain phrases and reduced what the gospel message is down to this cute little thing you can fold up and put in your pocket. And that way you got people say, oh, I'm saved. But they're living like hell. Oh, I'm saved. And there's no abandonment of their rebellion. They're actively in rebellion talking about they say, why? Because I went to the altar. Why? Because I prayed this prayer. Why? Because I repeated after that person. Why? Because I love Jesus. Oh, Jesus done so much for me. He blesses me all the time. Yeah, but we're talking about do you believe? That means I place my trust. We talk about that a lot. I place my trust. When I turn around and I sit in this chair, I don't think about None of y'all thought about it. Okay, let me check this. Who made this chair? Okay. The Vico Manufacturing Corporation. That's Torrance, California, and Conway, Arkansas. Oh, here's a number here. 1-800-44-VERCO. Give me the phone. Let me call and make sure. The pin number is 20062. Check to make sure this chair is sturdy enough. Okay, what is this, steel? Yeah, this looks like steel. Mm -hmm. Notice, prevent structural failures. Nobody did that. You walked in here, gave somebody hugs and kisses, and turned around and sat down. You put your full trust in that without thinking. And you relied on the fact that this thing was going to keep you up. Now, that's small compared to what we're talking about here. But to believe means that I trust in Christ and I'm going to rely on him. So not only have I turned toward him, not only have I abandoned my rebellion, the my way, I'm now going God's way, by the way, on all issues. So abandoning your rebellion isn't like I'm going to follow what the Bible says on these 17 things. But these three, I think, you know. Because, you know, how are you going to tell somebody who to love? How are you going to tell somebody what to do with their body? We can't judge people. Abandoning my way means, oh, I'm going with what God says on every issue. What's the issue today? We're talking about immigration? Okay. What do I, what's your view of immigration? Oh, my view of immigration, what God says about immigration. Yeah, but don't you think that, no, no, it doesn't matter what I think. Because <laughs> I have abandoned my thinking. I've abandoned what I think is right. I've abandoned my reasoning. What well, Olu says, based on, that's done with. So when you come to me with questions, when you come with me with how I'm going to live my life, oh, it's what God says, period. Drop my feudal weapon of, 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 of rebellion and place my trust and reliance on him. I've given him, say, okay, God, I'm going to let you decide what happens in my life right now. No matter what I want to do, no matter where I want to go, no matter who I want to be, I'm relying on you and your word to guide me in that way. That's what it means to believe. John says, these are written. If we wrote everything, we could fill up the world with books. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is God, that there is a God, and Jesus is him. He is the creator. He is the Messiah. There is sin. There is rebellion. There is death. He came to die and raise again to free us from that and usher in his kingdom of peace and hope no matter what you're going through. And oh, by the way, to get that, you have to turn to him, abandon your weapons, abandon your rebellion, and place your enti the entirety of your trust and your reliance in him. And then John says, but these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The gospel message that we preach, the gospel message 
that I share with my family, that I share with my coworkers, that I share with people around me has to include all these elements or they're not, it's not going to be the full gospel message. It's going to be some small element of the gospel message that we use to try to con people or trick people or push people into being saved. If your gospel message doesn't talk about God, doesn't talk about the fact that God exists, talks about that God is creator, because that's essential because God exists and because he's created, that means he has a way. And his way is the way we should follow. In sin. Can't have a gospel message without sin. The gospel means the good news. Problem is a lot of time we preach the good news without explaining the what? Bad news. <laughs> the reason is good news because, oh, they are bad news. And so we go out preaching and we go out teaching. We go out witnessing people just telling them the good news. Hey, God loves you. He wants the best for you. He's got a plan for your life. All those things are true. So why don't you just believe? You know, he died for you. So he, why don't you just believe on his name, believe he's died, and God will just transform your life. All those things are true, but that's not the gospel message because you didn't tell me nothing about the problem. God loves me. Okay, my dog loves me. My mom loves me. My friends love me. I got love. I'm good. I don't need God. Yeah, yeah, but he loves you so much. Yeah. My people love me so much too, so I'm good. I got money. Got people love me. Why do I need this Jesus thing you're talking about? It just seems like extra stuff. No, but he loves you, and he got a plan for you. Yeah, I got a plan, too. See, we need to let people know, oh, oh, oh by the way, you're, you're, you're dying. It's dead man walking what you are because you're going your way, and you've rebelled against God. And by the way, you don't want to rebel against God. You're not going to win that battle. Romans says that the wrath of the almighty Jehovah God is on People who are unsaved right now. And we in the church haven't told them that. How are they to know? Paul said in Romans, how are they to know unless somebody tells them? We got people out there drowning and they don't even know they're drowning. We got people out there with the full-fledged wrath of God on them and they don't even know it. Why? Because we're telling them that God loves you. He wants a plan. He has a plan for your life. Which is true. But it's the love of God that we must teach is why God has made a way to escape his wrath. And so I must make sure that I'm getting the fullness of the gospel. Life in his name. Christ has come to release us from the bondage of both the power of sin because of our rebellion and the penalty of sin. Right now, because of my rebellion, not only is there death, I am under, Paul tells us in Romans, the power of sin and then the penalty of sin. That's two things. Power of sin. Paul says in Romans 6, you are a slave to sin. You can only do sin. That's all you can do. That is what you do. Moses wrote in Noah, and uh, Noah. <laughs> Moses wrote in Genesis about Noah that all the people were doing and imagining the most evilness that they could imagine in their mind. Because left to ourselves, because of our rebellion, we are death and we are decay. And we are now becoming futile and in bondage. And we are slaves against the power of sin. That's all I can do. Isaiah says, when you try to do your best, your goodness is like filthy, bloody, stinking rags. Why? Because I'm under the power of sin. Also, the penalty of sin, because of my rebellion, there's a penalty that comes with that. And that penalty is death. That's physical death. I'm going to die one day. Thanks, Adam. And then, more importantly, there's spiritual death. That means that's separation from this creator God who loves me. Yes, it's important to preach the love of God in the gospel message. But it's important to show why that's important. John said... I wrote these so you may believe, and because of your belief, you will have life. That means that God, Christ, will come and destroy the power of sin on your life, and he will come and destroy, take the penalty of sin from your life. Both the power and the penalty because of your rebellion, thus granting you life eternal and everlasting as opposed to to death. This is the gospel message. 
This is a message that we need to take to the streets. This is a message that we need to take to our schools. This is a message we need to take to our co-ops. This is a message we need to take to our teams. This is a message we need to take to our workplace. This is a message we need to take to our girls' night out. This is a message we need to take to our family members. This is a message we need to take everywhere we go because it's a message of life. Without this life, there is death and decay and bondage. That's the world that we're in. Romans even goes, Paul even goes even further that says, not only are we dying, but in Romans chapter 8, but he was reading it. The earth is under bondage. And the earth, this earth, is under the curse based on that. And that's why Christ said with this, when he comes with his kingdom, he's bringing a new heaven and a new earth. Because this one has been decayed and decrapted. I don't even know if that's a word. Because of our rebellion. And so Christ is coming to bring a new heaven and a new earth. That's the introduction to the introduction. And by the way, the time is looking right now. I'm not even going to attempt to start the next part because it's at least another 30 minutes. <laughs> but the gospel message, this is what we are going to be looking at for the next who knows how long. John's got a lot of books, a lot of chapters, 20 chapters. But we're going to be looking verse by verse at all of these things. Give you a sneak peek. John chapter 1. Remember John said, I wrote all this so you'll know these things. John chapter 1 says what? In the beginning was the? Word. And the word was? With God. And the word was God. So off the top, John is in this category. Why did I write the book? He wrote the book so you can believe. And so I'm going to explain each one of these things to you so that you may understand and that you may believe. And so he starts off with chapter one with maybe the, 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 one of the foundations of the gospel message. John says, if you're going to preach this gospel, you have to start with the foundation. And the foundation of the gospel message is understand that God exists. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him there was nothing made that was made. John said, to start your gospel message, you better talk about God, and you better talk about God as creator. That's how he starts off the book. In this area, he is God, and he is creator. Then as you read through, he talks about verse 14, and the word became, not 14, up to verse 3, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So he calls on this category. This word, this greater, he actually became flesh, and he came amongst us, and he walked among us. What's interesting is that because I'm in bondage, my, everything I do is wrapped up in this power of sin and penalty of sin. So it's not important just to know that Christ came and died. Before he died, he did something. He lived a life free of the bondage and power of sin. That's important to understand that. It's not that Jesus came and died. Oh, well, well, back up three years. What was going on those three years? Oh, he lived on this earth for 30 years before his missions, his, his, uh, 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 his, his work, his ministry started to show us that you can live on this earth without the power of sin, uh, without the penalty of sin. He did that. So I know by believing on him, I can do that too. Why? Because I've put my trust and reliance on him and he did it. So I know I can. So I don't have to sin now. Oh, yeah. As a believer, I don't have to sin. Because Christ has destroyed the power and the penalty. Paul said in Romans, so reckon yourself, realize, understand, remind yourself that you are dead to sin. Remember, you have abandoned that rebellion. And so because of that, that's why Christ came. Not, he came to die and to raise, rise again, but he came to live, to show us that we can have Life through his name. John 3, 16. Again, Jesus is telling you, for who? He starts here. For God. The gospel message better have God in it. So love the world that he gave. The gospel message better talk about the Messiah. His only begotten son, that whosoever, there's something you have to do. It's not whosoever likes him. 
It's not whosoever knows about him. Not whosoever knows some stories about him. But you have to abandon your rebellion. You have to turn to him. You have to drop your weapons, and then you have to place your full trust and reliance in him. Whosoever believes in him should what? Wait a minute. Well, why are we talking about perishing? The reason we're talking about perishing is because of the fact of this. My way versus God's way. Death, destruction, punishment, death. This is why the gospel message better entail death. It better entail rebellion. It better entail the suffering because that's what happened when sin entered the world. Whosoever uh, sh shall believe in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal, everlasting life. What does that mean? That means I'm free from the power of sin and I'm free from the penalty of sin. And when God brings his kingdom, there is peace and there is hope for me. Our gospel message had better have all these elements in it. And when we look at John and we look at Peter when he preached the gospel message, when we look at Paul when he was witnessing, when we look at the epistles, you see these elements all throughout the gospel. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness, mercy, God, and for your grace. We thank you, God, for this plan of salvation that you put into motion before the foundation of the world, God. We thank you that your love is what sparked this, God. So even through my rebellion that started with Adam choosing his way, all the way down to Adam's son, Adam's son, Adam's son, all the way down to my daddy, down to me, choosing my way over your way, God. We thank you, God, that even in my rebellion, you have made a way for me to escape the bondage, the power, and the penalty of sin, God, by believing, turning to you, abandoning my rebellion, dropping my weapons, putting my total trust and reliance in you, God. We thank you for life that you've given us, God. And I pray, God, as the body of Christ, this local body of Christ, these, us as followers of the way, that we will do our part to infect Babylon, to infect the world out there with this gospel message over these next few months, three years, through eternity. God is God. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.